Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Dr. Lawrence Smith, Executive Vice President and Physician in Chief at Northwell Health and Dean of the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine. I also chair the Roundtable on Health Literacy at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. I welcome you all to today's workshop, Providing Literate, Health Literate Virtual Health Services. This workshop will explore what we know about the opportunities and challenges that virtual health services and telehealth may present for individuals with different levels of health literacy. We look forward to hearing about what best practices there may be for health systems and providers to ensure that they are providing health literate services. This webinar is hosted by the Roundtable on Health Literacy. The Roundtable is a convening body comprised of health literacy experts from academia, healthcare, pharma, community-based organizations, and other fields. The Roundtable holds public meetings such as this one to share promising and best practices and cutting edge research around specific topics in health literacy. I'd like to thank Rose, Kelly, and Christy, the staff of the National Academies, for their assistance to the Roundtable in putting on this workshop. Today, there will be three panelists joining us. Each speaker will present and a moderator will ask a question or two that pertains to their presentation. After the conclusion of our final speaker's presentation, we have reserved time for a moderated discussion that will feature all three of our panelists in conversation together. This session will include audience submitted questions. As we go along, please submit questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your, your Zoom screen. We will do our best to address them. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded and will be archived at the Roundtable website, nationalacademies.org slash healthliteracyrt. Please note the recording will be posted to that webpage about one week after the webinar takes place. I would now like to introduce the first moderator of this webinar. Dr. Olienka Shanbola, will be moderating the first presentation and it's my pleasure to introduce her. Dr. Shambola is an associate professor in the social and administrative sciences division in the School of Pharmacy at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She teaches on the psychosocial aspects of medication use and the role of the pharmacist in the public health system. Dr. Shambola's research program advances the use of patient-centered interdisciplinary approaches to improve medication adherence health literacy, and health equity. I will now turn the conversation over to her. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for the introduction. I am pleased to be here and to introduce you all to our first panelist, Dr. Marina Serper, who will present on what her research team has learned about telehealth use among older adults and to comment on what the health system she works for is doing to overcome some health literacy challenges. Marina Serpa is a transplant hepatologist at the VA Medical Center in Philadelphia, an assistant professor of medicine in gastroenterology at the University of Pennsylvania Paramount School of Medicine. She's a health services researcher and focuses on investigating barriers to access and quality care utilizing health technology to improve care delivery and outcomes, and evaluating our health literacy, medication understanding, and cognitive function affects health outcomes. Thank you for being with us here today, Dr. Serper. I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shambola. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so thank you so much for the opportunity to present to you today on health literacy and telehealth. We will first discuss the landscape of telehealth with the COVID-19 pandemic. Then we will discuss some health literacy and telehealth data that we have gathered as part of the C3 study in collaboration with Dr. Wolf from Chicago, Feinberg School of Medicine. We will then discuss um, an example of how to build a robust telehealth infrastructure from the ground up and use my health system, the University of Pennsylvania as an example. And then we will briefly touch on some best practices 
to um, ensure equity in telehealth as well as some future directions. So let's first talk about telehealth and it's uh, scaling up during the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, many of you probably know that telehealth had been on pace to grow gradually over the past decade or even more. However, video telehealth has really exploded with the COVID-19 pandemic since March of 2020 and shelter in place orders. And at the peak of the pandemic, telehealth grew, uh, telehealth outpatient claims grew by 78 times from the pre-pandemic volume. And then as of uh, the winter of 2021, we're still robustly at 38 times pre-pandemic levels. According to the Kaiser Family Foundation, if we look at predominantly older adults or people with multimorbidity, uh, for example, Medicare beneficiaries, we can see that telehealth went up from 18% being offered to Medicare beneficiaries to 64%. Now, what we need to make sure we pay attention to is that technology use is not equal among all be uh, Medicare beneficiaries, and uh, this is definitely also the case for commercially insured patients. For example, less than half of Black and Hispanic Medicare beneficiaries say that they own a computer. And you can also see from these data that those living in rural populations and older adult adults, particularly those over the age of 75, are less likely to own a computer or smartphone, which can limit their telehealth access and use. So let's now go to early work that we conducted during the COVID-19 pandemic. And this was work that I was fortunate to collaborate with Dr. Michael Wolf at the Center for Applied Health Research on Aging uh, in the Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago. Uh, we formed what's called a C3 uh, cohort study in rapid response to the COVID pandemic. This stands for COVID-19 um, and Chronic Condition Study. And what this study did was leverage five NIH-funded studies that were already enrolling, either cohort studies or clinical trials. And these were studies of patients with chronic comorbidities, older adults, and kidney transplant recipients, where patients had previously been enrolled either at academic medical centers or federally qualified health centers in Chicago. These studies collected very detailed sociodemographic, psychosocial, health literacy health literacy information for other purposes. So this is a cohort that had ro very robust data. And what we were able to do was leverage this cohort and ask them questions about their responses and perceptions during the COVID-19 pandemic. So the original study objectives were to ask, how are middle age and older adults with underlying health conditions and those at, at uh, risk for adverse outcomes from COVID-19 responding to the pandemic? And what are the consequences of COVID-19 on their health status, access to care, and ability to self-manage chronic conditions? In addition, uh, Dr. Wolf allowed me to add uh, a panel of telehealth questions to really assess the uptake and acceptability of te telehealth in this cohort. And so we were able to target about 1,300 patients who had completed a recent study interview as one of these five cohorts. 783 were contacted the first week that the shelter in place orders went into effect. And we ended up recruiting nearly 700 adults with an 86% response rate from the original study. When you look at the study demographics, we have mostly older adults with a mean age of 62, one third are black, one in five are Latinx, 11% with limited English proficiency, one third of this cohort is living below the poverty level, two thirds have multiple medical conditions, and about half have limited health literacy as measured by the newest vital sign. I'm going to present you some data from wave five. They have now been five waves, and this was a wave actually that took place later, December 2020 to March 2021. And so here's a little bit of information on telehealth use. So on average, study participants reported two to three telehealth visits in the past four months. You can see the, the box plots on the right are showing you telehealth visits by literacy level. We did not find that there were any differences in telehealth access by these different patient characteristics. For example, literacy, age, limited English proficiency, race or ethnicity, and by self-reported health. However, we did find notable differences in the use of video telehealth and perceptions of telehealth. 
So for example, patients with low and marginal health literacy compared to patients with adequate health literacy were less likely to have a video visit, less likely to have a specialty care visit, more likely to have difficulty recalling what was discussed during the visit, less likely to recommend telehealth to someone else, and less likely to find telehealth very useful. Those with limited English proficiency were half as likely to have a video visit, half as likely to think a telehealth appointment was just as good as an in-person appointment, and less likely to find telehealth very useful. And those with poor self-reported health were twice as likely to have difficulty recalling what was discussed during the visit, which has significant implications, of course, for the quality of healthcare delivered via telehealth services. So now having these data in mind um, and having heard about the, trem the tremendous explosion of telehealth services and the groups that may be particularly vulnerable to have lower quality visits, I actually want to pivot and talk to you about how my health system adapted to this rapidly changing landscape and how we actually were able to address some of these barriers to telehealth and uh, work towards promoting telehealth, uh, equity in telehealth services. So here was our challenge. So I work for a large tertiary care um, system where prior to the pandemic, our telehealth programs were rather boutique. So we had telegenetics, we had teleneurology, and most of our programs, and one that I participated in in liver disease, were as part of research programs because reimbursement was quite limited. And so we were conducting less than 100 visits a day. And our pre-pandemic vendor required a specific software, a specific workstation. Um, it was a complex workflow that only a few providers knew how to do. And we were missing key features such as interpreter services and direct patient messaging about how to log into the visit. So our challenge was how might we adapt a telehealth program that served that previously um, was doing less than 100 visits per day now to serve 6.7 million patients uh, with these shelter in place orders and knowing that we had to serve at least we had to um, conduct at least 70% of our visits virtually, if not more. And in fact, at the height of the pandemic, some departments conducted 90% of their visits virtually. And so here was the health system response. It was a very rapid response and many people didn't sleep for many, many days. And some of you may recall the early days of the pandemic. So we um, right away picked a different vendor who would be able to host thousands of visits per day. And this was BlueJeans. Um, this was selected and deployed over the course of one weekend. We also deployed a telemedicine command center to support both patients and clinicians. And this was staffed by our EHR, the health record transformation team, and actually many volunteer medical students who were sent home from their clinical rotations and were able to help uh, build up this telehealth infrastructure and to answer patient and clinician questions and provide early technical assistance. We also developed something which I think is quite unique, um, our own in-house wrap around telehealth platform. We call it Switchboard. So the reason why it's wrap around is that it integrates uh, patient messaging, with the scheduling uh, function of the EHR and the EHR. And this allowed us to automatically message the patient and the provider and conduct inpatient and outpatient visits uh, much more seamlessly without really having a person call everybody and give them their specific vi uh, uh, video link. So it really automated this function and was instrumental for us. If we step back, just wanted you to also understand that Penn had actually been investing in telehealth for a long time. We had the Center for Connected Care um, that we had been investing in over the past decade, and we have a very robust telehealth infrastructure, but it had to be scaled up very rapidly. And the, the good news was that the health system was well poised to do this because there was already a Center for Connected Care and a Center for Network Telemedicine with experts and engaged clinicians across the health system. I'm now going to show you just a couple of examples of patient-facing virtual video visits, which is here on the bottom right within this ecosystem and how we were able to deploy this. So here's right now how it looks from the patient perspective. So we're right now, again, talking for, you know, about direct telehealth from uh, patient to provider in a live uh, video conference. 
Um, so at the time of the scheduling, the patients received a text or an email with a visit guide, say this is an automated message, here's your telehealth appointment. They're pretty easy to see large buttons that patients can click on and they can actually make sure that their technology, whether it's on their phone, tablet, or computer works um, and that they're able to do the video visit. And um, three days before the visit, they get a similar reminder with a visit guide and they do not need to be logged into a patient portal to access these materials, which is very important. Uh, the visit guide also provides the patient some information about what kind of lighting you want, that you don't want to be in a noisy area, and ideally you would like to have access to good broadband internet and to have your camera available. So um, some specific instructions to enhance the visits. Then they get another reminder, which is 10 minutes before the visit. So they don't have to look through their phone or email in case they lost the messages. So they get a text or an email and all they have to do is click on this link and uh, they can join the visit. Now I can tell you that earlier in the pandemic, we required a download of specific software, the BlueJeans software, and uh, we found that patients were having difficulty downloading the software. And, um, that what worked best was actually a direct link. So it took us a while to get to that point, but it once we got there, it made the visits a lot more seamless. The other thing that we do is the ability to convert lots of the visits from in-person to telehealth, which is also important because the pandemic has taught us that things are constantly changing and visits that may have been scheduled in person or rescheduled in person had to revert back to telehealth. So we have a nice automated way of doing that as well. The other nice functionality that it took a, a bit to build, but obviously was very important for us to do, was language translation services. So the switchboard function has an on-demand two-way text translation. So we can also receive translated texts from the patient or their caregiver. And we can select from 65 languages and message the patients through the switchboard. And there's also the capability to have live video interpreter third-party services during the video visit. Uh, some of our health system leaders actually polled the providers to see what were the, the principles of telehealth that they thought were important to have successful visits. And this is what they said. I'm not gonna read all 14, but I just wanna focus on some of the patient facing ones that are important. So the fact that there's no patient app download that's required makes it a lot easier for patients. Obviously having reliable, high quality audio and video connections is a very important lesson that everybody learned. The other important point was it's better for patients or at least easier to not have the telehealth platform tethered to, a, to an EHR portal. So again, this requires username and login that patients might've forgotten. Uh, the other important factor is having these multi-party connections where a spouse or a sibling or a caregiver can join the line from another location and where an interpreter can also join, as well as screen sharing for images and also teaching the patient or even showing them some of their own data. And I've used this functionality and patients really like it. I wanna show you a little bit of our on the ground experience in our GI and hepatology clinic. And the data I'm gonna show you don't even reflect all of the more recent functionalities. This is sort of early telehealth, but at least it shows you what we did with the Blue Jeans platform and the switchboard. So what we did was we uh, queried patients who had telehealth visits early on in the pandemic in the first four weeks, either in gastroenterology or liver clinic. And we, um, tried to enroll about a thousand patients. We sent questionnaires through the online portal, but we supplemented with about 250 phone calls because we knew that not all patients were able to log into the portal and we wanted to capture a variety of experiences. So we measured patient perceptions of telemedicine in the first four weeks. And what we see here is that in general, patients thought that their visits were high quality and the technology was relatively easy to use. Where we do see some variability is thinking the patient's perceptions of whether or not the visit is as good as a face-to-face -face visit. And so just to highlight some other differences, 
we saw that younger patients and those who are already enrolled in a portal, so more digitally literate, if you will, were more likely to report their visit was high quality, which is certainly not surprising. We also found that Black patients were less likely than white to report that the technology was easy to use and less likely also to have video visits, which has also been borne out with data. We also asked providers uh, what they thought what were the top three concerns that came to their mind. This was early on in the pandemic. And you can see providers really had a lot of anxiety that patients would not be accepting of telehealth, that there might be technology issues, there might be workflow and scheduling issues, and they were not able to do a physical exam. What we found was very interesting from the patient perspective, uh, and I understand that patients were grateful that they were able to access care, but we got almost uh, uniformly positive responses in the first four weeks. And again, again, this reflects the fact that patients, I think, were very appreciative of the fact that services were able to be pivoted very quickly and efficiently from in-person to telehealth. Our telehealth volume uh, is very robust today. Now we've shifted many of our visits now back to in-person, but we're a very agile health system. So we are able to scale up or down as needed. And right now we're definitely averaging well over a thousand visits a day and up to 2000 on some days. These are data over the past few months. And so in summary, just wanna leave you with this slide. Um, and uh, basically, we really need to understand that even though COVID catalyzed telehealth expansion, this is really a unique opportunity for us to facilitate access to care, but we really need to make sure we do not leave patients behind. So those who are low health literacy, BIPOC patients, those with um, limited English proficiency, older age, multiple comorbidities can face ongoing challenges and are definitely at risk of suboptimal visit quality, whether it's not being able to connect or not having access to good internet or not being able to recall the instructions that are imparted uh, during the visit. And so health systems and payers should really operationalize telehealth best practices, engage patients and caregivers, make sure we have integrated interpreter services, simplify technology and workflows, offer training and support to patients and staff, and continuously monitor the quality of services to ensure access and equity in telehealth. And thank you very much. Wanted to thank my uh, collaborators at Northwestern and at the University of Pennsylvania. And I'll take any questions at this time. Thank you, Dr. Serpa, for your presentation and for showing us how the health system that you work for has overcome some health literacy challenges with the telehealth expansion. Um, I have a question for you. As a provider yourself, can you comment on how providers might benefit if health systems focus on health literacy in virtual health services? I think providers would benefit um, because patients, if, if we were providing health literate services, we would be able to provide very clear instructions before the visit of how to schedule the visit. We would be able to help patients reconcile medications. We would be able to provide very clear written or, uh, uh, you know, not necessarily written, but electronic instructions at the end of the visit. So I think if we can um, add uh, health literate services to the in-person visit, it can help with efficiency and it can help patients um, have the written information that they need so that they can um, basically have it in front of them. They don't have to be responsible for recalling things or writing things down. So I think we still have a ways to go in terms of improving our after visit summary or after visit guide. And I think this is an area that we really need to focus on. How do we make sure that the things that are discussed in the visit are imparted and they're in the health record? We do have a patient instructions field. So I do usually fill it out and it's there in, in the portal. But I'm, I'm sure that there are ways that we could do this um, where it's more adapted to reading level and it could be translated. So those are some of the ways. Thank you so much for answering that, Dr. Serpa. 
And um, I see all the questions come in, but we will take more questions at the end. Okay. At the moderated discussions for you. So I would now like to introduce Jem Dows, our next moderator. Jem is a health policy analyst in the Office of Health Equity at the Health Resources and Services Administration, HRSA, where he is advisor and coordinator on the special needs of Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and other Pacific Islander populations, as well as lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender populations. Jem's portfolio includes developing resources and organizational capacity for cultural competence, language access, and health literacy. He's also an adjunct professor in Asian American studies at the University of Maryland at College Park. Jim. Thank you, Dr. Chianbola. So I would like to introduce you all today to Ms. Bothwell. She is a program analyst in the Office of Policy Analysis and Development within the Center for Policy and Evaluation at the Administration for Community Living, which is one of the agencies of the uh, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, so one of my sister agencies. So Ms. Bothwell provides recommendations on and develops health policies that promote independent living and incorporate disability rights and the rights of older adults. Her recommendations are based on feedback from the aging and disability networks, congressional reports, statutes, health studies, legislation, and other supporting data and materials. Her areas of focus include telehealth, 1115 Medicaid waivers, effective communication, and assistive technology. Today, she will explain what the law requires around accessibility in telehealth, and what we know about the actual experience of the disabled community with telehealth. So Ms. Bothwell, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, Jem. Thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you to everyone who has invited me here today. I am honored to be here. I know that uh, the last, it's the last week and a half of the fiscal year, so it's a bit stressful, I know. Um, I'm certainly honored that we are taking the time today to, that everyone is taking the time today to join us. Next slide, please. So I'd like to briefly mention a little bit about the Administration for Community Living and my role within it. Like Jem briefly mentioned, um, I'll give a little bit more information. So um, ACL, it, as Jem mentioned, is an operating division within the US Department of Health and Human Services or HHS. ACL was created on the principle that people, regardless of age or disability, should be able to live where they choose, with whom they choose, and fully participate in their communities. Next slide, please. So here are some of our authorizing legislation. We are supported by the Older Americans Act, the Rehabilitation Act and the Developmental Disability Act, as well as other uh, statutes and uh, authorities that are granted to us. What we do is we uh, give grants and provide grantees and nonprofit organizations support who support people with disabilities and older adults, uh, as well as uh, those organizations who conduct research on these populations as well. I do want to take a moment to highlight the assistive technology state grants because it is very relevant to this uh, conference. So the state and territories of which there are 56 total uh, do receive grants for the purpose of uh, states and territories to improve the provision of assistive technology to individuals with disabilities of all different ages through a comprehensive statewide program 
and they're uh they are responsive to consumers and so we have a role in explaining uh how that how these uh, services can be provided to communicate uh sorry communities and consumers particularly during covid uh so a lot of this was assistive technology was able to be provided through the cares act funding uh, and so we had a great deal of inventory that was able to be uh, acquired through that funding, or there were programs that were set up for older adults to learn actually how to use telehealth technology. And <clears throat> they would, some of these programs would uh, provide what they called telehealth bundles to their populations with some of these uh, technologies and trainings. Uh, some other programs would uh, it would do things like device demonstrations or uh, provide technologies such as joysticks uh, that may be an assistive technology, large print keyboards, screen readers. There were many options available and that are still available, which uh, you are able to uh, look into and uh, find on the national website at3center.net, uh, which is a link that I will post later as well. Again, that is at3center.net. Each state and territory has their own programs, which are listed there. Next slide, please. So I want to give some information on the legal requirements and background here. The main federal laws that I will be speaking about now are the Americans with Disabilities Act or ADA, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, and Section 1557 of the Patient Protection and Affordability Act of 2010. So these three laws generally state that persons who identify with disabilities may not be excluded from participation in, denied the benefits of, or of services or programs or activities, or be exposed to discrimination on the basis of dis disability by any covered entity covered entities <clears throat> covered entities may not provide any aid or benefit to persons with disabilities that do not have equivalent results and benefit to those without disabilities so they must reach the same level of success and effectiveness excuse me as uh, their services and benefits that they provide to non-disabled individuals. Uh, of course, there is a waiver for this if it would cause undue financial or administrative burden, or if it would require a, um, pardon the interpreter, if it were, would require a fundamental alteration of the program itself. Uh, of the program or activity, pardon me. So either though, even though those two exceptions may apply to covered entities, they still have to take action to the maximum extent possible to make sure that people with disabilities are receiving the benefit of, or uh, the benefits or services that that entity provides. Next slide, please. Uh, which outlines, oh, excuse me, actually, pardon me, if you can go back one more. Um, apologies, this slide outlines the different types of covered entities under each of these uh, laws. I will mention Title III of the ADA has 12 categories for places of public accommodation, which include professional offices for healthcare providers, hospitals, social service centers, insurance offices, 
and pharmacies. Under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, federal financial assistance can include Medicaid and Medicare reimbursement. Uh, so, okay, next slide. Covered entities must ensure that communication with people with disabilities is as effective as communication with others, which can also include family members, friends, or associates who have disabilities. Next slide. Effective communication may also require the provision of what's called auxiliary aids and services to ensure effective communication with people with disabilities you may need to utilize auxiliary aids and services and these auxiliary aids and services must be provided at no charge what type of auxiliary aid and services will depend on the type of communicate communication used by the person with disability, by the, complex, the complexity of their communication, and uh, the context in which that communication is happening. And so uh, the last speaker did mention interpreters, uh, readers. So for example, people who are blind or low vision may need what's called qualified readers. Uh, there is also something called CART, which is similar to a stenographer, a person who is transcribing uh, the verbal communication live. Uh, there are also captioning uh, features, other types of electronic information and technology must be accessible as well. And so the ability to use must be there to use these technologies independently or integrated within the service provision uh, for all of these assistive technology features. Next slide. A, quality, a qualified interpreter is defined as someone who is able to interpret receptively and expressively, effectively, accurately, and impartially using any necessary specialized vocabulary. This definition also applies to qualified readers, qualified speech-to-speech -speech transliterators, which is a person who is trained to understand unclear speech and repeat it again clearly. So, you have to be careful about uh, using adults as interpreters. The ADA does provide some limits to some limited exceptions to the rule, uh, but you have to be careful on using the persons who are there with the patient as an interpreter uh, because of the <clears throat> because of their ability to remain neutral, which may not meet the qualification for a qualified interpreter. For example, we can think of the Britney Spears case that's happening now and everything, all of her legal battles that she's been involved in when she has you know, certain persons with her uh, who may have um, you know, a stake in what she's saying. And so that person may not be neutral. Uh, and so imagine that that person were an interpreter First of all, they may not be able to be uh, neutral or impartial. They also, if it's someone's child or family member, they may not actually know the specialized vocabulary and be able to provide an interpretation at a high quality level. Next slide, please. Electronic information technology. Under the Office of Civil Rights, they have a paper that has been distributed uh, actually prior to COVID on accessibility of electronic information technology, including websites, electronic health records, 
so it's a great resource to review if you would, are looking at building out your telehealth system and processes. Next slide. So um, I really like this quote from when the ADA was passed that really says that, you know, they knew that technology would expand and would improve rapidly and that these services and accessibility needs to keep up with that. It's a key part of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is why I love this quote. Uh, next slide, please. So a couple of thoughts when you are considering how to establish your telehealth systems and your workflows as well. If you are thinking about, uh, one thing to think about is including a third party as the previous speaker did mention and touch on, it's very important that, you know, it may not just be interpreters, but you may need a captioner. Uh, as well, you may need a support personnel or someone who may themselves also be remote. And then uh, again, like the previous speaker mentioned, it takes time to uh, learn how to use these features as well. And so it's important to take the time to sit down with individuals and train them on your platforms and how to achieve a good quality telehealth visit. As was mentioned previously, assistive technology programs in your states may actually have options for trainings that are available for users with disabilities uh, on assistive technology and telehealth. So some common design considerations out there include using the web content accessibility standards or guidelines, which are referred to as WCAG. It is referenced in several statutes. It, <clears throat> the electronics uh, technology accessibility document that I just mentioned actually makes reference to it as well. So I have, uh, we have two different guidelines. There is WCAG 2.0, which is the slightly older standard. It was developed prior to really mobile apps becoming uh, as popular as they are. So now we have an additional standard that includes mobile app accessibility under WCAG 2.1. So that's, if you see a difference between those two. We have different levels of EIT or electronic information technology let, uh, accessibility going all the way up to what's called AAA. Uh, there is, there is, uh, there are papers out there describing how AAA is the highest standard and going into detail on how to meet that. Uh, some of WCAG, these web content accessibility guide standards, talk about contrast of colors. They talk about alternate text, uh, being able to tab, hit the tab button to move a screen reader uh, down the page quickly. Um, so that can be very helpful for people who are deaf or hard of hearing, people who are blind. Uh, and how they use technology. There are great explainers out there that can help you get a better understanding of that. There are research papers that also discuss the ability to personalize telehealth on the part of the individual with the disability or the older adult. Uh, giving them the option to personalize that experience can help them access it. Uh, it also, there's also the ability for providers themselves to remove certain features. For example, if a patient has a cognitive disability and may need or may not need certain widgets that are inherent to your telehealth platform, the provider may be actually, may be able to customize and remove some of those. Uh, 
I have also heard from the community that occasionally they will get um, they will get equipment in the mail from a healthcare provider and the accessibility features, for example, I know a lot of cell phones now have uh, text to speech or they, you know, they'll receive it for monitoring purposes and this device may already be turned on. And so then it can be a struggle to actually find how to turn you know how to turn this device on or how to use it if it doesn't have the accessibility features already set up so that is something to keep in mind as well okay next slide uh, and yes i'm coming close to time so this is my last slide and then i will wrap up i just want to pass along some statistics and just to note that my agency is not endorsing this research it's just some statistics that we'd like to share that are out there uh, the first one is regarding a study that was done with or rather a survey of people who are blind or low vision uh, and it was approximately a thousand uh, survey respondents 30 percent of those said that they had experienced a telehealth appointment of that 30 percent 21 percent said that it was not accessible the second study is regarding telehealth uh, unreadiness so telehealth uh, being not ready is something in that document they expressed that you know the person themselves may have a hearing aid but still not be able to hear because of compatibility issues or they may struggle due to dementia uh, or a, a person who may not be able to read small print uh, or even with you know specialized glasses uh, issues with lack of internet, uh, lack of email or texting ability, um, or instable, unstable internet, or lack of internet within the prior month. Um, I do know that there has been re a research study that I believe said 20% of people with disabilities more likely than not have access to a computer, smartphone, or tablet. pardon me for the interpreter to clarify, 20% uh, of people with disabilities do not have access to a tablet, smartphone, or computer where they can access a telehealth platform. As of December, Medicare benefic beneficiaries of age 65 uh, were significantly impacted. 27% of that group had used a telehealth visit uh, and so this is a large population that can have significant impacts. Uh, at this point, I will wrap up my presentation and turn it over for the next presenter. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Ms. Bothwell. So actually, uh, before uh, we go to the next presenter, I do have one question that I'd like to ask you. So one of the things that we say in health equity work is that nothing about us without us, right? And so I'd like to ask how might health systems work to engage the disabled community um, as they seek to improve their telehealth services right? uh, in a way that's informative, but also um, not putting additional burdens on them. But I think, you know, we do want that uh, community involvement. So uh, do you have suggestions on that? Yes, absolutely. One thing that I know is uh, that there are healthcare coalitions out there. I may suggest uh, reaching out to the Aging and Disability Networks. Uh, I will post a link on how to find those networks. Um, one thing you can do is reach out to those networks and ask them how best to provide uh, trainings or what recommendations they have from people with disabilities, or even they may be willing to provide user testing uh, from users with disabilities. Um, I also wanted to say that including people with disabilities 
in the workflow process is crucial from start to finish from the time that that person makes a phone call to the healthcare provider all the way through to the end of their treatment or care. Uh, it's so that they are prepared, they know what to do, they know how to schedule the telehealth visit, and they have, uh, you know, for example, I am a person with a disability, and I have come across that situation where I found it very important to when a provider thinks about not just how to schedule the visit itself, but actually how can the person with disability in, be integrated into your workflow from start to finish. So that may be something that's worth asking questions about and engaging with that community to learn more about what would benefit them. Um, and I, I maybe I should have mentioned this earlier, but ADA.gov, which is part of the Department of Justice, they have an informational hotline. And so care professionals and uh, practitioners can actually reach out to the Department of Justice directly and receive information through that hotline. Great. I knew you'd have a lot of good resources. So thank you very much for your presentation. So now I'd like to turn it over to our next moderator for the final presentation. Thank, thank you, by the way. Okay. Uh, so uh, our next uh, moderator is Jay Duhigg, and he is the Director of Patient Integration and Patient Safety at AbbVie Inc. He co-leads the Safety Division and Analytics Function for AbbVie's Pharmaco Pharmacovigilance and Patient Safety Division. And he has expertise in human factors, health literacy, risk communication and the development of drug and device instructional materials for patients and healthcare professionals. For the past 12 years, Dr. Duhigg has focused on patient safety research at AbbVie and at the University of Illinois College of Pharmacy. So I will turn it over to you now, Jay, to introduce my colleague from HRSA. Perfect, thank you, Jim. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce Whitney Wiggins as our final panelist. Ms. Wiggins is currently a public health analyst with the Health Resources and Services Administration. In her role, she oversees the evidence-based telehealth network program in the Office for the Advancement of Telehealth. She has over eight years of experience in the public health field with a special focus on health education and rural health disparities. Ms. Wiggins, thank you for being here. I'll turn it over to you. Afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the introduction, Jay, and thank you to the National Academies of Sciences for inviting me to present today at this roundtable workshop. I'm very excited to follow the wonderful speakers before me and uh, present information that the Health Resources and Services Administration within the Office for the Advancement of Telehealth is um, doing to support programs that are working with telehealth in rural communities. Next slide, please. Today during my presentation, I will give an overview of Health Resources and Services Administration and then more specifically, some of our programs within the Office for Advancement of Telehealth. And then from those programs, what are some of the key uh, practices we have been seeing and grantees and awardees have been sharing with us when it comes to uh, digital or virtual literacy? Next slide, please. So during the fiscal year and 19 activities, currently there are over 1,300 HRSA awards that include a telehealth component um, within their programs. And that includes over 50 states and eight federal districts and territories that have received these awards. And so telehealth activities across HRSA um, include being able to support distance learning, being able to support workforce, direct clinical care, infrastructure, as well as research. And this is across um, all of our bureaus and offices. We actually have a telehealth work group at HRSA uh, that includes representation. So not just within the Office for Advancement of Telehealth, but across HRSA as an administration. Next slide, please. So HRSA is the home for the Office for the Advancement of Telehealth. And the Office for Advancement of Telehealth serves across HRSA, um, as well as helping 
the United States Department of Health and Human Services to leverage telehealth. So this includes improving access, enhancing outcomes, and supporting both clinicians and patients, as well as research. Uh, the Office for Advancement in Telehealth, which we refer to and I'll uh, refer to in this uh, presentation as OAT. Um, OAT promotes the use of telehealth technologies for healthcare delivery, education, and health information services, as well as providing funding for direct services, research, and technical assistance within the field of telehealth. HHS has recently elevated the role for the role of OAT to be able to create a more focal point on telehealth that will serve across HRSA. Uh, previously, we were in the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. And this effort comes um, to be able to build on the key regulatory and program investments that have been seen in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic and have expanded the use of telehealth nationally. And so with this charge, uh, we will continue to link together the department's broad efforts in leveraging telehealth to improve access, as I said before, enhance, and, and enhance outcomes and uh, continue to support clinicians and patients. So there's two primary roles within OAT. Uh, we have programmatic roles, and that's funding of services, research, and technical assistance. And then they, we have a policy role, so uh, keeping up to date with policy and research as it is related to providing telehealth services. We are also responsible for administering two types of programs. Uh, we have our telehealth network grant programs, as well as our telehealth resource center programs and centers of excellence. And we have a focus on uh, underserved as well as rural populations. Next slide, please. The Office for Advancement of Telehealth does envision that its investments are contributed as a continuum. So of grant programs that help to advance the provision of telehealth services to rural and underserved communities, while also simultaneously being able to build the evidence base for telehealth. So we do that across the several programs that you see here on this slide. Uh, one of the programs includes the Centers of Excellence, which help to monitor really what the clinical and cost effectiveness of telehealth visits are um, compared to in-person visits, also looking at being able to build on evidence based within telehealth. And they accomplish this through their publications and continuing to discover uh, promising trends when emerging issues within telehealth. Another program is the one that I oversee and You'll see examples from today, the evidence-based telehealth program. And this is a effort to be able to compare nationwide um, common measures when it comes to telehealth services versus services received in person. We have our telehealth research center, which analyzes and publishes telehealth research using data from our evidence-based programs, as well as broader telehealth research and disseminates that in order to um, be able to contribute to information on clinical and cost effectiveness when it comes to rural and underserved communities. Some other programs that are within the Office for Advancement of Telehealth are the Telehealth Net work grant program. We also have our licensure and portability grant program, which supports partnerships between states and state professional licensing boards. Uh, we have our telehealth broadband pilot program, which was recently awarded. And this is a joint program and effort between several agencies, uh, the Federal Communications Commission, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture, being able to work together and really assess uh, existing um, gaps in broadband and specifically within four states, Alaska, Michigan, Texas, and West Virginia. So uh, at the end, being able to link uh, these states and communities within these states um, to broader resources. Next slide, please. 
Our telehealth resource center programs are established throughout the states nationwide. So there are two national telehealth resource centers that we fund and 12 regional telehealth center, telehealth resource centers. And so the national resource centers are focused on policy and tech, and then one is focused on technology. And then the regional centers are um, provided throughout the states to really be able to provide expert and customized technical assistance to regions uh, throughout the country. In 2019, the telehealth resource centers had uh, 4,039 technical assistance inquiries and reached nearly 9,000 attendees in their trainings and webinars. Um, but you'll see as um, the pandemic has influenced the number of technical assistance inquiries and their reach. In 2020, they reached 200,000 participants, um, had over 2,000 outreach events, and that was a 200% increase from the previous year. Next slide, please. The evidence-based telehealth network grant program um, is, does, has had two previous cohorts uh, prior to the most recent two cohorts. So they've had programs that have focused on teleemergency. Uh, and then in FY18 or fiscal year 18, HRSA awarded the telebehavioral health evidence-based network program. Um, and that was awarded to 14 organizations across 13 states, and they focused on telebehavioral health services over a three-year period. And so there will be some examples that I'll give later from this program. And the program is based on a hub and spoke model. So that means there's a site that's distant that has a clinician, and then in the rural community, um, the patient would go to their maybe local provider or another provider that's closer to be able to receive those behavioral specialty services. Um, but with the pandemic, a lot of services were transitioned to directly to the patient um, at their location. So that has really helped inform um, some of the information that I'll share um, regarding virtual literacy and what the awardees were able to do within the best practices. And to, 2019, 2020 year, um, there are nearly 3,000 patients um, that saved over 700,000 miles in their travel for care uh, through this program specifically. And we are uh, recently funded this month a new cohort, which is focusing on the direct to patient um, care for patients within primary care, behavioral health services, and acute care. So we're continuing and looking forward to learning and, and building more on evidence base and being able to uh, assist providers and patients for really what telehealth looks like um, in the direct to patient or direct to consumer field. Next slide, please. The Telehealth Network Grant Program is another program uh, that there are some examples from, and this has been uh, supported since 2003, and there's been several uh, cohorts and focuses uh, throughout this program. Our most recent one is during the fiscal year 2020. Uh, we were able to award to 30 organizations across 23 states who are focusing on telestroke, Telebehavioral health, emergency, um, teleemergency, tele EMS, and telecardiology. Um, you'll see also a growth in the miles being able to be saved via the telehealth services being provided. So, fiscal year 17, um, 1.6 miles were saved in travel. And most recent data we have from fiscal year 2019, uh, over 3.2 million miles in travel saved for care. Next slide, please. So ASPE published a brief in um, July of last year examining uh, the changes in Medicare fee for service and primary care visits. Uh, as one of the speakers before me um, presented that there's definitely a spike in a rapid change um, in use of telehealth versus in-person care uh, with the COVID-19 public health emergency. And so you'll be able to see on this slide uh, just a visual of what that looked like, both in the rural and the urban areas. 
And they concluded um, that Medicare's new telehealth flexibilities did play a critical role in helping to maintain access to primary health care services. And this also uh, played a, a primary role too in helping rural communities uh, when it does come to digital inclusion, um, because there's the flexibility for not just audio and visual uh, telehealth services, but providers being able to provide audio only to services and that being included in a telehealth as a telehealth visit. Next slide, please. So on this slide, you'll just see uh, the definition from the National Digital Inclusion Alliance on digital inclusion. And so it refers to activities that are necessary to ensure that all individuals and communities, including the most disadvantaged, have access to and use of information and communication technologies. And um, health equity continues to be a priority um, within HRSA as well as the uh, broader Biden-Harris administration. And even within HRSA, we've seen over the last year, several offices and bureaus are establishing health equity work groups to help be able to assess and be able to enhance how they are in addressing um, health equity, both internally and externally. Next slide, please. So this slide uh, from the same alliance uh, gives information about the elements that are included when it comes to digital inclusion. And several of these are often barriers for individuals, both patients and providers in rural communities. So the first one that's listed there, when you think about affordable and robust broadband internet service, that's a, a barrier that we often see within rural communities. Um, being able to access digital literacy training and really get in, getting quality technical support um, is another top barrier that we see within our rural communities. Next slide, please. So what is our office um, doing about digital inclusion? And uh, really it's, it's more of me sharing what our programs that we fund are doing um, to be able to address and um, meet uh, digital inclusion when it comes to the communities that they are serving. Next slide, please. So the first example I wanna share is um, one of our awardees actually joined their state's task force on broadband. Um, and so sometimes uh, it may not be something that the organization takes on alone, but on a broader level, being able to contribute to what a task force or even starting to form a task force um, around broadband or around digital inclusion efforts um, is a step that communities and, and programs can take. So this task force included coordinating and designing surveys, uh, focus groups and questionnaires, um, recommending to be able to map and really collect data um, and have a centralized reference when it comes to digital literacy classes, um, being able to list organizations that were willing to assist in providing tech support. So um, out of this task force, there were this was one of the recommendations that came, um, as well as the second one you'll see listed here, really uh, possibly establishing a statewide digital equity fund. And that includes being able to strengthen and support digital inclusion and activities and ideas. And so um, that support would be working with the internet service providers in the state to be able to develop best practices and that can support broadband adoption as well as digital literacy and affordable internet access. So this is just really taking um, digital inclusion and virtual literacy beyond just what uh, organization may be able to do at their site. Next slide, please. Um, another thing that we heard from our awardees when addressing uh, digital literacy is uh, several programs said that they were actually able to be leaders in their organizations um, due to them having a telehealth award or telehealth grant. So when services did transition from in-person 
to telehealth. Uh, they were the go-to uh, program to be able to transition not only patients, but also helping providers to transition. So making sure that there's provide providing support services for both patients, clients, um, and providers. So at the start of the transition, they found that there was more time being spent providing on technology support, which limited the time for the providers to really address what the patients were coming into the coming into the telehealth appointment for um, their medical concerns. So they were able to find ways to assist with this. And this included setting up assistance for the patient prior to the appointment. Um, that may be a letter, an email. Uh, one of the speakers said before me, they were sending out texts. And so being able to connect and send instructions for using technology um, that may be able, that explains what the services are prior to the patient setting up an appointment. So when the transition was first occurring and that notice of letting patients know our office is transitioning from in-person to telehealth or our office is now offering telehealth, going ahead and including information about technology and setting up instructions then. Having a specific point of contact within the office uh, for patients to be able to reach out to with questions. Uh, sometimes within offices, there may be a shortness of staff. And so it may be an extra role or responsibility for a staff member, but it also may improve the quality of the workflow. It may improve the quality of the experience of the patient um, to be able to have that, that role. And also doing a, a pre-appointment tech check. And so uh, setting up time prior to the appointment when the patient is scheduling their appointment, allotting time uh, prior to the actual doctor or specialist coming on the line to do a technology check and recommending apps uh, that are easily accessible for the patient. And so um, I really liked how a speaker um, before me, I think it was uh, Dr. Marina was talking about, they learn um, being able to what platform, so using that direct link to the patient versus the patient um, going through the platform. So understanding and, and doing some research on what might be some easily accessible apps for the patient to use uh, when accessing remote patient monitoring or when accessing their actual telehealth services. Next slide, please. Another uh, element is using digital navigators or patient coordinators or community health workers. And these can really help the underconnected or unconnected um, population with being able to address their digital skills. So having that balance of being tech savvy, savvy or what their ed educational skills be, may be, and also being able to address uh, cultural competency when it comes to telehealth and learning uh, telehealth services. So having community partnerships uh, for patients there when prior to COVID, when a lot of our sites were doing the what we called hub and spoke model, um, they had that assistance right at the office. So um, that was a piece that was lost during the pandemic. Um, and so awardees had to shift and, and really transition their coordinators to be able to continue to, within the workflow, provide support through calls, um, as well as maybe even if the patients were comfortable um, coming to the patient at their location. And so you'll see on this slide uh, for the University of Kansas Health System that a lot of their feedback for highest satisfaction Faction were results that were associated with having a navigator or coordinator um, at the site. Next slide, please. We also saw that sites and programs uh, were developing promotional resources. And this was even prior to COVID, just when introducing telehealth services to programs and especially in uh, the rural areas where they may not be used to using technology um, because of lack of access to technology for their um, health services, having promotional materials. And so one of our sites, Lester E. Cox Medical Centers, um, provided brochures and being clear on the brochure about what telehealth is, what can and can't be done during your telehealth visits. There may be certain evaluations um, they found within behavioral health that 
clients and patients thought could be done via their telehealth appointment, but uh, could not. How to be able to access telehealth services, so making sure there's a connection to a support person at the office or, or to uh, the nurse or, or even the specialists themselves um, for accessing telehealth services. And then making sure that they understood their community and that the community is represented and the materials that are being shared and prepared. Next slide, please. All right, so I just want to leave you all, um, this is gonna be a video and then uh, I know I'm coming to time, so I'll share one more resource uh, after this video, but just another way, making sure you're reaching a broader audience using visual audio um, for patients as well to understand what is telehealth. And so this is an example for Texas A&M University. The Texas A&M Telebehavioral Care Program provides high quality, easily accessible telehealth counseling services to residents of the Brazos Valley, Texas, and beyond. We have been providing telehealth services for over a decade to our local communities, eliminating barriers of transportation, distance, and cost by providing virtual services, often free of charge. Doctoral counseling students provide these services under the supervision of licensed psychologists. Counselors are available to talk through a variety of issues, including depression, anxiety, relational issues, and so much more. This can take place through individual counseling, couples counseling, and groups. The process of receiving care is simple and begins with calling 979-436-0700. After we determine your eligibility for services, you will be contacted to set up an appointment. Two options are available for meeting with your counselor over video. If you have good internet, a private space, and a smartphone or computer, home, may be a great location to access sessions. However, if these means are not available, you also have the option of going to the nearest access point, equipped with ready-to-use technology in private spaces to meet with your counselor. Either way, we will ensure technology is accessible and functioning. Starting your telebehavioral care session is easy. Click on the link sent to you in an email or text message and follow the instructions provided. We look forward to connecting with you soon. So this video is something that uh, could easily be linked on a website for your organization, um, as well as if you have a YouTube channel um, to be able to quickly uh, allow your patients and audience, your patients and clients to have understanding of their services. And we also have a resource, a new resource uh, within la the last year is telehealth.hhs.gov. And so um, this is a trusted website and resource for both your patients and your providers, uh, information for providers for setting up telehealth services, workflow, um, information for providing equal access, and then also information for patients for understanding how to access a telehealth uh, service. So I just want to thank you all for the time uh, to speak, and um, I will turn it back over to the moderator. Thank you, Ms. Wiggins. This was a terrific uh, description of different resources and research that, that, that's happening. Um, one question I'd like to ask you, and then we'll transition it into a, a broader uh, discussion among all our panelists, is um, the impact of inequitable broadband access has had on access to virtual services. As you said, I'm thinking about those offices that transitioned and would put a notice out that said, we, we've gone virtual and those people that don't have broadband or, or, or access to it and what it means for them. Yeah, no, that's a, a great question. And um, yeah, as you said, you know, for even the rural communities, having the office to even go to for the equipment or the broadband um, was a stretch, but now having to go to direct um, to the patient, um, they that access to broadband is not as easy available. So we had some programs that uh, worked with uh, their patients worked with uh, other resources in the community. So some patients were going to the library parking lot, were going to the school parking lot. Um, some offices, actually one in California, uh, Indian Health Service Clinic, 
would have the broadband and the patient would still come to the location but get the broadband from the parking lot there at the clinic location rather than going in to get services. Um, so it's really having to be uh, innovative in, in some ways um, to be able to provide those services, but um, that that's that's just one one way, a couple ways that, that we were hearing from patients from our programs. Very good. And I've been noticing in the chat there uh, have been suggestions on researchers that are looking at libraries and those other type of central hubs. So the, uh, thank you. Um, we're now going to transition to our all panelists discussion. Uh, as a reminder, please place your questions in the Q&A function of Zoom, uh, not in the chat, but within the Q&A. And uh, I'll turn it back over to uh, Dr. Shimbola. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the panelists for your different wonderful presentations. Um, the question, I believe this might be for Dr. Serper is, as we know, um, pri patient privacy is very important in inclusion of patients in telehealth. Um, were patients instructed ahead of time um, to find a venue for the telehealth visit where they felt very comfortable? That's a really good question. And, you know, part of our pre-visit guide does uh, explain to patients that really try to find a quiet area to do the visit. Now, I'll, I'll tell you that in the real world, I've had patients do the visit, you know, on their lunch break somewhere outside of work because it was challenging to take time off work or they would go into their car, you know, and, and do the visit over their lunch break. And sometimes it would be noisy. Um, I've even had a couple of patients driving where I had to ask them to pull over. <laughs> so, you know, despite our best efforts, um, patients uh, see the convenience, but obviously don't always, don't always pick a, a nice quiet place. I think we, we probably, could do an even better job of explaining that to patients. And I think um, I showed some of our pre-visit guides that we've used. Some of them, as you have seen, probably have, you know, there's a lot of text and it's kind of small print. I think if we could uh, adapt that to different types of audiences, you know, with easier to read font, fewer words, bigger font type, I think that we could still improve our materials and the way that we uh, do our pre-visit and post-visit guides. Thank you, Dr. Serper. Uh, um, do other panelists have other comments as well on this question about ensuring the privacy of patients? Okay, I'll move it over to other moderators to ask a question. Uh, I have one. So Given that research on virtual health services and health literacy practices within those uh, services, how to uh, really uh, achieve um, the, the, the best outcomes for patients in ways that are practical and sustainable, what do you think are some of the current gaps we're seeing in the research as all these different programs have emerged in response to the pandemic? I don't know, is that a question for me? I'm, I'm happy to answer. Or be open to <laughs> any of the-, the um, Well, that I'll, I'll jump in. What, what strikes me is we, we don't yet know what is the right dose of telemedicine, if you will, you know, for patients who are chronic patients. So the combination of video visits, telephone visits, and in-person visits based on the disease state, based on the acuity, based on what the symptoms and what's going on, we haven't really figured out how to optimally implement telehealth into clinical care. So that's one of the uh, areas ripe for research. Yeah, and um, I would agree with uh, Dr. Marina and, and being able to understand and provide more resources really for our providers. Um, something we're also hearing, especially now that there's a lot more direct to patient is caregivers. What information and resources is out there for the caregivers to help with the telehealth appointment, um, having resources for them when it comes to digital, digital literacy and um, 
to, to the question before, even resources and information on what security um, looks like during these telehealth um, appointments. And so there's been a lot of flexibilities uh, for different platforms to be used. Um, however, once the public health emergency um, is ended, what, what happens to the security and, and helping people to understand um, that as well. Uh, if we have time for one more, I um, wanted to bring up this question from uh, from one of the participants, and uh, this uh, Ms. Wilson asked, "What are your thoughts on being able to continue telehealth visits in the future for more follow-up visits as opposed to initial first-time visits?" Um, and uh, and she adds, "Where you're not familiar with the clients, right? So, um, is in any of the research or or uh, experience?" Um, do we know anything about follow-up? Well, I can tell you from the clinician experience, follow-up lends itself pretty readily to telehealth, more so probably than the initial visit. It's, it's nice to establish a connection with the patient and keeping that connection just anecdotally seems it doesn't seem to be impaired with follow-up telehealth visits. However, establishing a connection when there's a possibility of an in-person visit may be more challenging. But I work in a field where there is, uh, there is value to physical assessment. Um, thinking about mental health fields, um, that, that may not be the case, for example, and, and uh, psychotherapy, counseling, and things like that. So I think it depends on the setting. But I think that follow-up visits is where actually uh, there's a lot of use uh, for telehealth, and I would like to see that continue. Oh, thank you for that, Dr. Serpro. I have this other question for uh, all the panelists. Um, how can we encourage health systems, providers, organizations? You've all touched on all these different stakeholders in your presentations. How do we encourage them to address health literacy and these accessibility barriers as they provide virtual health services? So I can uh, just speak to, uh, uh, as in my presentation, but a uh, great asset that was seen within our programs is really the care coordination. So not just transitioning the telehealth services for the provider and the patient, but really being able to bring in a, a care coordinator to also help connect those other and link other resources. So um, that takes the burden off of the provider trying to find it or the, the health system um, specifically trying to find it, but we're providing a role for specifically um, that connection. Other panelists have comments? So I'll ask another one. So um, what do you think are the gaps in research? What, what other questions should we be asking uh, and doing research on as we move into this new normal of telehealth? Hi, yeah, this is Lisa. I'll go ahead and answer that. Um, so one thing that it's not just applicable to telehealth, but also applies when you're thinking about other languages that are you're observing being used other than English and how people in those communities uh, communicate and use their language. You know, I think that we could use um, we could use some uh, more research on what languages to be providing. I know that one of the presenters did provide a list of all the languages they provide, which was very impressive. Um, one thing that I, I know there is a requirement to provide effective communication to people with disabilities under different civil rights laws. Um, 
So it is not a factor based test, like how many people speak this language in that community. It's not the same kind of test to uh, set that requirement. Um, but the challenge is, you know, what the experience of people, for example, who use sign language, uh, what I've seen, where I've seen uh, significant gaps in in uh, research on language uses is that it will include spoken languages, but not sign languages. And so in America, we do have, you know, different types of signed languages even. So we have American Sign Language, which is the most well known. Puerto Rico actually has its own sign language, as does Hawaii. And there is also Black American Sign Language, which has been written about at Gallaudet University and studied uh, to some degree. So uh, how does that you know, manifest in healthcare and in accessibility as well uh, is something that could definitely use more research. Well, thank you all for your wonderful presentations. I want to note the time and we, I, we do have a ton of more questions and hopefully we can get those answered um, and sent to all the individuals who ask them. Um, but I want to wrap up this really interesting discussion. Um, I want to thank all the presenters for sharing with us your knowledge about what health literacy can look like in virtual health, health services. And we are definitely looking forward to engaging more with this concept and improving access, improving equity as we move forward as virtual health services becoming, they continue to become increasingly common and also become um, and expand as well. So at this point, I would turn it over to um, Larry, Dr. Smith to um, finish us up. Thank you all. Well, thank you again to everybody here, the panelists, moderators, audience, for really a wonderful session and for really thoughtful discussion. I think the beginning of a discussion, uh, if anything. Thanks also to the National Academy staff for organizing the workshop and to our audience members for attending. As a reminder, please check back to the event webpage to find the workshop recording in a week's time. And so that you can stay up to date about future webinars and workshops, please sign up for the listserv for the roundtable on health literacy. We hope to see you again. Thank you and have a wonderful day. <laughs>